Hey folks, this is Riker with another Diablo lore video. In today's episode, we discuss the story of Diablo Immortal, how the broken shards of the World Stone posed a new threat to humanity. This is part 17 in a video series in which we explore the major players in the story of Diablo, from the Nephilim to Tyrael to Deckard Cain to Diablo himself, and give a crash course on what exactly is going on story-wise in this game series. Feel free to check out our previous episodes if you haven't, and be sure to have subscription notifications turned on so you can catch when new episodes come out. I'd like to have at least one more episode out before Diablo 4 releases to get fully caught up on the timeline. In our last episode, we covered the events of Diablo 2's expansion, Lord of Destruction. How a band of heroes defeated the last of the great evils, Bale, Lord of Destruction. Oh, that's why they named it that. But they were too late to save the World Stone. So we left off with the World Stone having been exploded rather thoroughly. Our valiant heroes, having defeated Bale, said, Job's done. And headed home in triumph. However, the job was not done. The World Stone served as a sort of cloaking device, keeping Sanctuary hidden from heaven and hell. And it also prevented angels and demons from coming to Sanctuary in large numbers. You know, like army size numbers. So that's gone. Sanctuary just appeared as a massive blip on Heaven and Hell's radar, and the drawbridge has been lowered to allow armies to come charging right in. But wait, there's more. The exploded shards of the World Stone landed in different parts of the world, and thanks to Bale having corrupted the World Stone prior to its uncontrolled demolition by Archangel Tyrael, they basically poisoned the lands that they landed in with demonic corruption. The largest shard of the World Stone landed in the ocean near Stormpoint, a prison island settled by the Kingdom of Westmarch. A giant sea creature that lived by the island then swallowed it up, I guess assuming it was the world's largest tasty salt crystal. Meanwhile, within the Burning Hells, there's been stuff a-brewing. All three big boys, Diablo Bale and Mephisto, have been gone for a while, leaving a power vacuum. And I don't mean Dyson. During the Dark Exile, which we spoke about in a previous video, Asmodan and Belial were waging a civil war in Hell. During this time, a demon named Skarn, who was once Diablo's most powerful lieutenant, took this opportunity of chaos to... scheme. After the destruction of the Worldstone, Skarn hatched a plan. If he can get his hands on just one of the Worldstone shards, he can use its power to strip humanity of the angelic part of its nature, leaving only the demonic side. This, in turn, would allow Hell to end the stalemate and finally win the eternal conflict and destroy Heaven. But he didn't want his master to return and foil his plans, because uh, he wanted to be the master now. Look at me, sure. I'm the captain now. Last we saw Diablo, he had been defeated in Hell by our heroes. Well, Skarn took Diablo's skull and crafted it into a mighty throne, which would serve the dual purpose of being a power source for Skarn by siphoning Diablo's lingering energy from it, while also preventing Diablo from respawning by binding Diablo's spirit to the Skull Throne. You gotta admit, a Diablo Skull Throne is metal AF. Using Diablo's power, Skarn created his own realm in Hell, the Realm of Damnation, and built up an army. He then began to extend his influence into Sanctuary, forming the Cult of Damnation and growing it rapidly over the next few years through the power of temptation and, well, Outright lies. But let's lay out our timeline here. In the year 1263, that's when Diablo 1 took place. Prince Aiden defeats Diablo beneath Tristram. In 1264, that's Diablo 2. Aiden becomes Diablo and is defeated by a band of heroes. In 1265, that's when our heroes defeat Bale. Five years later, 1270 is when Diablo Immortal is set. By this time, the Cult of Damnation had grown into a real threat to the Western Kingdoms and Skarn put his plan to search for the Worldstone Shards in full swing, rallying a new demon army to his cause. But thankfully, evildoers weren't the only ones seeking the Shards of the Worldstone. Ever since its destruction, Deckard Cain had been researching ways to keep Sanctuary safe in a post-Worldstone age. Cain recognized the threat that the Shards of the Worldstone posed, and believed that they must be destroyed. Using a Haradric ritual, he discovered the location of three of the Worldstone Shards. One in the town of Wortham, one in the cemetery in the town of Ashwold, and one in the Darkwood. Yes, the very same Darkwood from Diablo II in which we found the Tree of Inifice. So, Cain headed to Wortham to destroy the first shard. Unfortunately, Cain wasn't the only one to realize that Wortham was the location of 
said Shard. Skarn had zeroed in on the Wortham Shard and he deployed his cult to attack the small fishing town. Over the course of weeks, the cult abducted townsfolk and turned them into undead monsters, and the town's mayor put out a call for help. That's when a hero arrived, possibly with some other heroes, but whether this hero was aided by others or not, it does seem to be one main hero who came to be known as the Shard Seeker. Canonically, it's not clear who the Shard Seeker was, but they could have either been a barbarian that survived Bale's march on Mount Ariat, a necromancer, a demon hunter, a monk, a wizard, or a crusader. We've spoken about barbarians and necromancers before, so let's talk about these other factions. The demon hunters were a group that had just established themselves around 1270. They were people who had lost their homes and loved ones to demons and decided to dedicate their lives to vengeance. By 1270, they numbered in the hundreds. Not a huge group, but sizable. There are dozens of us. Dozens! And they established their base of power within the Dreadlands the lands shattered by the world stone explosion. And that was because it was a land free from government and replete with demons to get revenge on. Then Crusaders are one of the orders of knights devoted to the light, similar to Paladins. Remember when we spoke about Rakus, the Zacharum devotee who brought religion to the West? You know, through his March West? Well, around this time, a Zacharum priest known as a Khan had sensed corruption within the church. He was sensing Mephisto without realizing it. But he knew there was a corruption, and so he secretly founded the Crusader Order, recruiting only the most zealous and powerful warriors, while avoiding any who had paladin training, fearing they may already be corrupted. Akan then sent the Secret Order east into the Swamplands, eh, riding them conveniently out of the plot, while he remained behind to try to fight the corruption in the church directly. And he died doing so. If only he had an army of crusaders to help him. So now, many centuries later, in a post-Mephisto world, the corruption of the Zacharum was brought to light, and this emboldened the crusaders to reveal themselves and travel west to stamp out any remaining corruption. Then, as for the monks, aka the monks of Ivgorod, aka the Veridani, these are holy warriors that are rarely seen outside of their walled mountain city of Ivgorod. Ivgorod is ruled by the Nine Patriarchs, the heads of the Sapteb religion who are said to be reincarnations of the nine humans chosen by the gods to rule over the ancient kingdom of Ivgorod. Now dwindled down to a much smaller size. Four patriarchs are dedicated to order, four to chaos, and one remains neutral. This is to maintain balance. Hmm, balance, huh? Kinda like necromancers? The Soptav religion worships a thousand and one deities, which include Inna, goddess of the sky, and namesake of the Diablo III monks Innocent, Itar, the god of the sun, and it seems even some angels and demons are considered gods in this religion, with Tyriel being the god of justice, and Skarn taking on the role of the god of retribution. Now, as for the monks specifically, they're a militant order within the Saptev faith, and after a lifetime of preparation, anointed monks are allowed to leave their monastery to serve the will of the patriarchs. As for wizards, they're renegade magic users that cast caution to the wind and ignore the safety labels on magic that sorcerers and other magic users adhere to by channeling arcane energy itself. Many wizards seem to come from Shanzai, aka the Great Isle, an island north of the rest of Sanctuary's landmasses. We've spoken about Shanzai before, and it's Shan people. The Shan people were never dissuaded from practicing magic, which may explain why we see so many wizards among them. So anyway, our hero arrives at Wortham and saves some villagers, thereby ensuring that nothing bad would ever happen to Wortham again. But by this point, Iskara, the leader of the Cult of Damnation, had managed to get the Shard and was conducting a ritual to summon Skarn into Sanctuary. Deckard Cain tells our hero of the Shard and tasks them with retrieving it. And... They do so, stopping the ritual and killing Iskara. Now let's take a moment to talk about one of the Diablo II heroes, the necromancer Zul. You'll understand why in a moment, bear with me. You see, after the heroes who defeated Bale disbanded, Zul returned to the priests of Rathma and took on a number of apprentices, including a man named Metan and a woman named Lethys. The first looked up to his master with great reverence. The other had a strained relationship with Zul, as she thought her master was jealous of her and trying to stop her from one-upping him. This toxic work environment eventually led Lethys to quit the priesthood of Rothma. Fast forward again now to the year 1270, and Lethys is in Ashwald Cemetery. Hmm, where have we heard about that cemetery before? 
Oh yeah, two minutes ago in this video. So yes, Lethus came into possession of the Ashwold Shard. Very convenient timing, just like in Wortham. But we actually also heard about Ashwold Cemetery in a previous lore video in which we spoke about King Leoric. After he had his queen killed in his madness, she was buried in Ashwold Cemetery. And now that Lethus had the shard, it was the tomb of Queen Asilla that she was seeking. Why? Because Lethus believed that Asilla's spirit could lead her to Leoric, and that she can use the Worldstone Shard on Leoric to gain the power that Diablo had left behind in Leoric's soul, and thereby gain control over all undead. That's like the necromancer's dream, right? But remember, the location of Queen Asilla's tomb was kept secret. It was only Asilla's handmaiden that knew its location. And in her search, Lethus raised undead hordes and tortured her way toward an answer. You know, general villain stuff. So eventually, all this undead raising caught Zul's notice. So he took command of a skeleton, which he then sent to Wortham Chapel to warn the townsfolk. There, he found his old pal Deckard Cain and brought him up to speed while he himself was on his way to help with Lethus. Cain dispatched the Shard Seeker to retrieve the Ashwold Shard from Lethus, and with the help of Zul, the Shard Seeker stopped Lethus. But not before Asilla's handmaiden was slain and Leoric's spirit was resurrected for a second time as the Skeleton King, and promptly rededified by our hero, thereby ensuring that the Skeleton King would never rise again. But while the Shard Seeker killed Lethus, it turned out to just be a simulacrum of the former Priest of Rathma, made particularly realistic looking thanks to the power of the World Stone Shard. So while the Shard Seeker took possession of the Shard to return it to Cain, Zul vowed to follow after his former apprentice to put a stop to her once and for all, and to neatly write himself out of the rest of the story. The Shard Seeker and Cain rendezvoused in Westmarch City, where Cain said it would be a better place to destroy the Shards. There they met Charcy the Blacksmith, who apparently had gone bored of the rogue encampment and her life with the Sisterhood of the Sightless Eye, and set up a smithy in Westmarch City, where she became a local legend due to being such a famous character from the events of Diablo II. When the Shard Seeker met Cain in his workshop in Westmarch, the old Haradrim told him that there was no safe way to destroy the shards yet. But hey, may as well grab the third shard in the Darkwood while we're waiting. So the shard seeker goes to the Darkwood where some rogue rogues from the rogue encampment had formed the cult known as the Bloodsworn. After the destruction of the World Stone, a rogue named Lacri, who had a giant crush on her battle captain Kashia, quit the Sisterhood of the Sightless Eye because Kashia didn't like her back. No. So Lacri and a group of other incels, I mean rogue rogues, all quit together and formed the Bloodsworn, an all-female faction who pledged their allegiance to the Countess. Yes, the very same Countess that the Diablo II heroes killed. No one's ever really gone. The Bloodsworn revived the Countess and served as her followers. And then Lacri fell in love with the Countess, proving that she just has a pattern of falling for her bosses. So the Bloodsworn did evil things. This got Kashia's attention, and she led a group of rogues, including the High Priestess Akara and Flabby from Diablo II, and went after them. The Bloodsworn got hold of the Darkwood Shard and gave it to the Countess. But the Shard Seeker killed the Countess in the Forgotten Tower and retrieved the Shard. Now, with three shards collected, which was all the shards that Kane knew of at this point, the Shard Collector returned to Westmarch, so that Cain could destroy them once and for all. Unfortunately, Cain's attempt to destroy them failed. After conducting some more research, Cain told the Shard Seeker of the ancient Haradrim Zoltan Kool and about the Soul Stones. Cain figured that if anyone would know how to destroy these damn things, it would be cool. And he tasked the Shard Seeker with going across the world to find one of Kool's ancient libraries in a desert region of Kezistan known as the Shasar Sea in search of answers. So the Shard Seeker headed over and found the library and discovered that to destroy the Worldstone Shards, they need to use the weapon of an Archangel. And they learned of just such a weapon, Ilnira, a dagger owned by, eh, some angel, and currently located on the jungle island of Bilefen, just south of Aranok, in the temple of Namari, an ancient Nephilim. So the Shard Seeker retrieved Ilnira, brought it back to Deckard Cain, and they destroyed the three shards, the Wortham Shard, the Ashwold Shard, and the Darkwood Shard. But meanwhile, Skarn and his dastardly Cult of Damnation had traveled to Mount Zavane, a mountain in the northern region of the Tamo mountain range, 
because he knew a world stone shard had come in possession of some monks over there. Now, long ago on this mountain, Viridani monks and the Knights of Westmarch, aka the Paladins, fought a war against each other back during the Zakarum Inquisition in the time of Rakis. You see, the silent monastery stood on Mount Zavain, a temple to the Saptev religion. And since that religion is heresy, according to the Zakarum, the paladins felt that it must be purged. Inquisitions, am I right? So a branch of the Zakarum army, known as the Brotherhood of Light, led by Lord Martanos, slaughtered everyone they can find, including the monastery's patriarch, Sladian. Their actions were so extreme that they became known as Oathbreakers, because even by standards of crazy religious zealots, they were considered extremists. Now, as the patriarch Sladian saw that all hope was lost, he unleashed a demon that had been sealed under the monastery long ago. I guess as a final uh, F you to the Zakarum. The demon possessed Sladian, and a corrupting black mist spread out throughout the region that transformed warriors of both sides into undead. Over time, the monastery and the black mist, which lingered forever, would be forgotten. Now, backstory done, we can return to the present, or closer to the present. After the slaughter at the Silent Monastery and that region basically being condemned because of the Black Mist, a new monastery was built, the Sanctified Earth Monastery. Not as catchy of a name. An acolyte of said monastery was named Dravik, and his younger brother died during the fall of Mount Ariat back in Diablo II Lord of Destruction times. Since then, Dravik became obsessed with finding a way to resurrect his brother. Enter Skarn, who was, as you'll remember, the Veridani god of retribution. Or at least masquerading as their god. It's hard to keep track of a thousand and one gods, give this guy some slack. Dravik made a pact with Skarn, a deal with the devil if you will. In 1270, Skarn promised Dravik a means of bringing back his brother. All Dravik had to do was bring Skarn a Worldstone shard. No biggie, right? So Dravik raided the monastery, looking for the shard, going so far as to kill his master in the process, since he was empowered by Skarn's chaos magic. But he couldn't find the shard that the monks had retrieved and hidden away, and he was exiled for his crimes. I mean, there's just no coming back from killing your boss. He fled the monastery, but then came back with allies, Skarn's Cult of Damnation. This time, he was able to retrieve the shard. But this all caused a whole lot of ruckus, so the shard seeker was hot on Dravik's heels. However, Dravik summoned some demons to delay the shard seeker and fled to the frozen tundra in the Dreadlands, where he gave Skarn the shard. In return, Skarn resurrected Dravik's brother, as he promised, and they lived happily ever after. No, just kidding, he fused Dravik's soul with his brother's soul to transform them into some twisted demon monster, because the shard seeker had caught up to them and... Well, he needed to be dealt with. So as Skarn, with the Shard, blips away to his realm of damnation to complete his plan, the Shard Seeker kills the Dravik and Brother Abomination, then chases after Skarn straight into hell. You know we're coming up on the end of the story, because every Diablo story ends in hell. Well, except D3, which ends in heaven that has been turned into hell, but eh. Within the realm of damnation, the Shard Seeker finds captured angels and uses Ilnira to free them. Apparently, Skarn had been channeling their angelic energy to create his demon armies from demon pits. Since Ilnira can do whatever the plot demands of it at any given time, the Shard Seeker then uses the magic dagger to destroy the demon pits. However, unbeknownst to the hero, with every demon pit destroyed, Ilnira became a little corrupted. And before the final demon pit could be destroyed, it became corrupted enough for Skarn to take possession of it. Now, if you thought channeling energy from kidnapped angels was a great way to build a super powerful army, well, let me tell you, that ain't got nothing on channeling energy from a single archangel's weapon. With Ilnira in his possession and with the Worldstone Shard attuned to him, Skarn would now be able to build an army worthy of Mordor. I mean, he would... he... it... it's bad. It's just bad. Skarn is this close to demonizing all humanity and destroying heaven. Which is a bad thing. Thankfully, the Shard Seeker managed to kill Skarn before that happened. Otherwise, well, there'd be no Diablo 3 or 4. They used Ilnira to destroy the corrupted Worldstone Shard, and this was all the juice that Ilnira had left in her because the dagger turned to dust. With Skarn dead, the Skull Throne no longer kept Diablo's soul bound, and it escaped, now free to return in future Diablo sequels. Now, that marked the end of Diablo Immortal's campaign at release, but... It has continued to get story updates over time, and it'll continue to do so. 
New threats emerged, like the Cult of Terror loyal to Diablo, which went after the Stormpoint Soul Shard. And that black mist on Mount Sylvain, while that started spreading, its demonic taint needed to be ended by the Shard Seeker. Overall, given it takes place between two games, there's nothing really world-changing that could happen in Immortal, but through Immortal we do get extra insight into people, places, and events of the past. So we may revisit Immortal lore more in the future, but for now we have to move on to Diablo 3 to get caught up in time for Diablo 4. So what would happen to Diablo's soul now that it was free? Would hell or heaven ever invade Sanctuary again without the protection of the World Stone? What would become of Deckard Cain? All these questions and more will be answered as we continue to explore this Diablo lore series. Stay tuned. Until then, be sure to get caught up on past episodes. Thanks for watching. Special thanks to my Twitch, Patreon, and YouTube supporters for making these videos possible. If you enjoyed this video, please share it. Check out these other videos and subscribe to join Rikers Vaders for more Diablo content.